After you complete a few quests in Bunker Hill, Kessler, the leader of the settlement, wants a word with you. So Deb's been talking you up. Says you get results. I got a sensitive job that needs someone with skills, and more rolling around in their head than marbles. That sound like you? I'm all that. Plus discreet. Fantastic. Our town works because everyone knows we got the raider angle covered. The gangs get paid off and leave our caravans alone. But Zeller's army is getting greedy, asking for more caps. And after we pay them, the bastards still hit our people. But I found out the army's holed up in an old prep school. The job's simple. Deal with them. Know anything else about Zeller's army? It took a lot of favors just to get the name of their crash pad. The East Boston Prep School. Judge Zeller runs a strange outfit. Came out of nowhere and now they're players. I don't know what you'll find there. A lot's riding on this job. The pay better reflect that. I ain't gonna haggle on the price. I got a reputation to protect. But I'll throw in some extra supplies if you sign on. Best I can do. Consider Zeller's army dealt with. These guys are dangerous, so be careful. If there are survivors, rescue them. If any lost caravan hands make their way back into circulation, that'll do wonders for trade. But above all, you're just a freelancer working for yourself. Never even heard of us on the hill, right? Judge Zeller. Interesting name for a raider boss. Wonder why he calls himself a judge. We find the East Boston Preparatory School just east of Bunker Hill, north of the Mechanist's Lair. Outside the school, we find some interesting signs erected. Purified water inside. Traitor's welcome. Seeing things like this would make me instantly leery, but I wonder if anyone has fallen for it. As soon as we enter the school, we can hear raiders talking. Someone there? I hear someone. Combat there positions. There you are, you little bitch! There are stairs to the right and left of us. We can go up, but let's explore this first floor first. We hear a lot of raider activity, but at least on this first floor, we don't see anyone. The door directly across from the entrance is chained. We can go left and explore a few lockers, but then the only other opening is a classroom door on the left-hand side of the hallway. Again, we hear a lot of activity, but we don't see anyone. However, the quest markers are above us. Looks like the raiders we want are all upstairs. In this room, we find a skeleton slumped over a table next to half a dozen empty bottles of Nuka-Cola. In the box directly beneath it, we find the word fine spelled out with blocks next to a stim pack. Nearby, there's a broken down Nuka-Cola machine. Maybe after the bombs dropped, one of the pre-war teachers disassembled this machine to get at the Nuka-Cola inside. And then in his or her last moments, he drank it all. There's nothing much else on this floor. There are two bathrooms in this room. Both of the times that I did this encounter, I found a legendary rad roach. Heading out the nearby door, we come back to the hallway. There's an overdue book in one of the lockers. We find three or four overdue books here. Turning left down the hallway, we come to the end, but the door is blocked with furniture. However, there is a room beyond. Heading back and down the right hallway, we find a door to that room, but it also is chained shut. We can peer through a gap in the wall, and it looks like there may be bodies in there, but it's hard to see. At the end of the hallway, we hear more raiders talking. Climbing the steps, we find that the steps are completely broken, halting our progress. On the floor here is the skeleton of a woman bathed in sunlight from the window. Near her hand is a coffee mug and some bubble gum. I'm not sure what the significance of this is. Could it be a television or a movie reference? If so, I don't get it. Coffee and bubblegum, in my mind, don't really go well together. Well, since this pathway is blocked, we have to go all the way back and climb those stairs that we saw when we first arrived. As soon as we get to the top, we get attacked. <laughs> On the raider's body is something unique, something I've never seen before. A blood contract. This startling message is written in blood. And it says, With my blood I do swear my life to the judge and his jury until the end, upon pain of torture and death. So this zeller has set himself up as a judge, and he forced his raider gang members to make blood packs with him. This seems like an extreme thing to do, even for raiders. Rounding the corner, we come upon our first pocket of resistance, hiding behind sandbags. Right here, right here. Ah! 
In one of the lockers, we find the skull, spine, torso, and pelvis of a skeleton. Now, I think it's pretty clear that any pre-war teacher wouldn't have naturally died in this position, so I think we can assume that the raiders have been posing the skeletons that they found here when they arrived. This means that I don't think we can trust the remains that we find here to tell a cohesive story about this school. The place has been compromised. We don't know if this is where they were naturally, or if the raiders were just having fun. Inside the bathroom, we find an overdue book on the toilet, and to the east, there's a hole in the wall that leads to a stage of some sort. Here we find one raider whom we can dispatch. There are no doors on this upper platform or stairs leading down. We have to jump down to explore. Here we find two skeletons in wheelchairs. Maybe these were handicapped people who died watching a show when the bombs dropped. Or maybe the raiders were so sick that they assembled these skeletons and put them in wheelchairs because they needed an audience. On the stage, we find tables set up and bullet holes in the tables. At first, one thinks of maybe a barricade. Maybe they were trying to protect themselves. And yet there's really no room behind the table and they don't provide that good of cover. So my next thought was maybe that these were targets and that the raiders were performing target practice until we get to the very last table where we find a fresh corpse of a settler lying against the table. Perhaps these were set up for target practice, but using live dummies. Or maybe this was a place of execution. Settlers and caravanners who didn't do what Judge Zeller said might wind up here. After all, every judge needs a courtroom. He's got skeletons out for an audience. His other raiders are the jury. Perhaps this is the room where he tried quote unquote guilty travelers and then executed them on stage. There is a thick splattering of blood against the table right beneath the head, but no bullet hole or any other wound on the body. We can loot a stash of caps and two different ammo boxes. There's a weapons workbench in the corner and that's about it. To leave, we unchain the only door and discover that this is the chain door that we first found upon entering, which means that to get back to where we were, we've got to go back up that stairway and retrace our steps. In the first room to the left, we find a vault tech lunchbox on the ground and a frag mine. Hiding? For me? Not even possible. Now that we know these are here, we're going to have to be careful. There are quite a lot of vault tech lunchboxes here since this was a school. I walked away with three robot models. Disarming another frag mine and going through the door to the right, we find the skeleton of a man in a lab coat tucked behind a door. Maybe this was a chemistry teacher because we've entered a chemistry lab. There are more frag mines to disarm and then beakers and lab equipment on all of the counters. Here we find one mini nuke up on display. At the end of this room, we find a chalkboard. The word professor is crossed out. Then we find one solid line and a question mark. This should remind us of the Poseidon energy plant, where we found a similar chalkboard and similar markings on the walls. At that time, I wondered whether or not it was some sort of code, and I got many interesting responses from viewers who were trying to decipher it, but I'm starting to think that these may not mean anything after all. We only find these scribblings in raider locations, and they're often the same. A question mark here, the word okay there, a line here, some other word there. Remember, the only words that we ever find on these chalkboards are the same words that are used in the railroad headquarters. Professor, for example, is one of the nicknames you can give yourself if you decide to join the railroad. Glory, which we found in the Poseidon Energy Plant, is on a chalkboard in the railroad that has a list of all of the active railroad agents. So it could simply be that Bethesda was mining the only source of handwritten chalkboard messages that they had, the ones that they made for the railroad headquarters, to use as set decorations in places occupied by raiders. I'm starting to think that these really don't have any further significance. Heading out this room, turning left down the hallway, we come to another hallway, and we can turn left down that hallway to enter a lecture room. This also may have been a recording studio because we find sound bafflers on the wall and microphones stacked up in one of the closets. Or maybe it wasn't a recording studio, but maybe they did performances here. Maybe they had a school choir. Or maybe they recorded some of the lectures that took place here. In the far western corner, we find a hole in the ground that leads to the bottom level. Here we see two corpses lying on a mattress. 
Rivers. Jumping down to explore, we discover that they are settlers, just like the settler that was executed in the auditorium. But again, no more enemies. The enemies all appear to be upstairs. There's a lot to loot down here, a duffel bag, some ammo crates, a wooden box, a footlocker. And at the opposite end of the room, we find another stack of bodies lying over tables. More settlers. And then peering up, we find holes that go through all of the floors in the building. Why are the corpses gathered in these corners? Why don't we find any indication as to how they were killed? In this room, we also find an overdue book terminal, which is great because we find three or four overdue books here. We can exchange the books for tokens to reduce inventory weight. But sadly, this terminal doesn't have anything interesting for sale. It looks like its inventory is automatically generated. I got two different menus of items. All of them were very common items the two different times I went through this dungeon. Unchaining the only remaining door leads us back out to that hallway on the first floor. This was that chained door on the other side of the wall that had the holes that we could peer through. But since we have a jetpack, let's go back to that first hole and jump on up to the second floor to go back to where we were. We find a frag mine by the podium, and then we can pass through a hole in the opposite wall to reach a classroom. Here we find find yet another frag mine and a vault tech lunchbox. Heading out this door leads us back to the hallway. We can turn left to find that broken staircase. Now that we're on the second floor, we can continue on up to the third. As soon as we reach the third floor, we find a raider hiding behind a sandbag barricade. In the room to the right, we fight two raiders. Wait, did you hear something? <laughs> Here we find caravan prisoners encaged in cells. It looks like these are the caravanners that Kessler told us to rescue when we got here. These are all novice locks, you can unlock them if you want, but we find keys later that will unlock all of these doors. The strange thing is that unlocking the gate is not enough. You actually have to talk to the prisoner before the prisoner will escape. Nice. Excuse me. I couldn't take much more of it. Thank you. In this room, we find a chair with fresh blood on the floor, and it becomes apparent as to what's going on. These raiders were torturing people. This third floor was their primary base of operations. It was here that they tormented and interrogated people. X688 notices this as well. An interrogation chamber. Rudimentary, but effective. If the interrogation did not go according to plan, or if their torture was so extreme that they killed the settler, they simply dumped the bodies down the hole, which dropped to the very bottom floor. In this northern room, we find our first terminal. None of the terminals in this building have any pre-war history, but we learn a lot about what Judge Zeller was doing here. This is their record of new recruit initiations. The first is a record of Stinky. They tried breaking him down with isolation, but he only responded to fire. He signed the blood contract after they burned the soles of his feet. It was only then that they gave him food. The next entry is about recruit Redfinger. He gave very little reaction when Judge Zeller broke his finger but he couldn't stand it when they removed his teeth with pliers. He finally signed the blood contract after being starved and threatened with losing a fourth tooth. Next is Killer. Zeller guesses that this guy used to run with another tough crew because apparently Killer smiled at everything they did to him. He liked getting tortured and he spit in their faces. Ultimately, they had to kill him. Heading south into the next room, we find the cell keys on a desk next to the southern terminal. These are more recruit initiations. The first entry is Fishface. They beat him until his face swelled up and he couldn't eat. Then they let him heal, and then they beat him again. After a couple rounds of this, he got skinny real quick. When they pulled him out of a cell for a third round of beatings, he finally agreed to sign the blood contract. He was then put on the initiation crew. Looks like all of the raiders in Judge Zeller's gang were forcibly conscripted, and then in turn tortured new caravanners and new settlers that wandered into the high school. The next one is Rock Teeth. The guy didn't flinch to the usual methods of torture, not even having his teeth pulled but he finally signed the blood contract when they threatened to poke out his eyes and chop off his hands. The final recruit named Beggar just wanted to die. He pleaded with Judge Zeller to just kill him. But of course, that would have been a waste of their time. They lured him in here for a reason. So they starved him and gave him regular beatings, which didn't work until they threatened to lock him into a cage with rats. Only then did he sign the blood contract. 
This may be a reference to George Orwell's 1984, where the only way that party loyalist O'Brien was able to break the will of the main character Winston was to threaten him with a similar fate concerning rats. In the southern corner by another cell, we find another hole that leads all the way down to the floor where they were dumping even more bodies. Heading out this room to the hallway, we pass the skeleton of a woman in a pink dress. This may have been a principal or a disciplinarian of the school because she has a yardstick in one hand and a cutting board on the other. Corporeal punishment like this was common in prep schools of the time, so unless this skeleton was posed by raiders, this likely was a disciplinarian. Heading down the hallway and into to the room on the right, we find where Judge Zeller and his raiders slept. There are a dozen dirty mattresses on the ground and sleeping bags. As we head to the door to pass into the next room, we come face to face with Judge Zeller himself. But we make quick work of them. This room was his throne room. We find typical raider decorations like posed dummies. And on top of shipping pallets, we find his throne. I think it says a lot about raider mindset that we find thrones in so many of these raider gang strongholds. When Nuka World came out and I started publishing all of these videos on raiders, I had many viewers trying to say things like, well, this is a post-apocalyptic world where there is no morality, so you can't judge raiders by the morals of today, and they're just doing what they need to do to survive, and so on and so forth. But going through encounters like these, we are reminded that what these raiders do goes far beyond survival. Judge Zeller didn't just want to survive, he wanted to rule. He made a throne for himself. He lured in settlers and caravanners, kidnapped them, and tortured them by pulling out their teeth, burning their bodies, poking out eyes, and letting rats feast upon them until they signed contracts in their own blood to join his little gang. There are so many people in this world who survive without having to do any of those things. So what we're talking about here is not simple survival. We're talking about a clash of cultures. On one hand, we have a culture of farmers and traders who try to survive by working with each other, by trading goods, by offering services, by helping each other, and then getting help in return, by building a civilization that benefits more people. The opposing culture is that of raiders, where they pit themselves against the world. They're not content to survive. They want to rule. They're not content to eke out a living honorably, they want riches, they want power. One culture builds a new civilization that helps a great many people, the other culture feeds off of civilization like a parasite, draining it of all of its resources. And ultimately, it is self-destructive. Remember, the only reason we are here is because Judge Zeller and his raiders started to ask for too much. They got greedy. Had they actually provided a service by actually protecting Bunker Hill, then Kessler would have never sent you to get rid of them. But instead, they preyed upon Bunker Hill, and they preyed upon the caravanners, disrupting trade and ending lives. And when that kind of thing happens, civilized people have only one option. Behind a junk wall, we find what is likely Judge Zeller's personal home. Here we find a first aid kit and some loot on a table, and a steamer trunk, which is actually pretty disappointing. Heading out and through the door on the other side of the hallway, we find the bathroom. Here on the floor, we have what might be a janitor dead on the ground. He's clutching a bottle of bourbon. And if we can believe what we see here, then perhaps his last decision in life as the bombs dropped was to drink from this bottle. In the stall on the left, we find two mannequins with pumpkins on their heads, with a toilet bowl filled with bubblegum. These raiders, yeah, I don't know if this is a sense of humor or if they are just aimless, idle, and don't know what to do with their time. Needless to say, I did not find it that amusing. As we go around the broken hole in the floor to the final room, we find a handmade tripwire on the ground. Looking across the table, we see that this is attached to a gun trap. We can disarm the tripwire and then go and disarm the laser rifle and the gun brace. On a nearby table, we find Astoundingly Awesome Tales, which improves the effectiveness of Radaway, causing it to heal 5% of all radiation damage. This must have been the computer lab due to all of the blasted out terminals. And in the far corner, we find an advanced locked safe. There's a skeleton on the ground here that is not remarkable, but back outside, we find a broken doorway with a skeleton hanging upside down in it. There must have been a fourth floor on top of this one, and something dramatic happened 
to make it completely collapse, crushing this poor person. We can leave the school by using the double doors at the end of this room. Here we appear outside and we see the broken fuselage of a plane lying smack dab in the middle of this school. And at last we realize what the dramatic event was that could have collapsed all of the floors in this building, that could have caused the man to get stuck in that doorway. Like many of the other crashed flights in Fallout 4, this plane must have lost its ability to navigate. The EMP blast must have knocked out its engines, and instead of finding a runway or a road, it crash-landed right in the middle of this school, killing God knows how many children, teachers, and workers. Heading back to Bunker Hill, we can talk to Kessler to report our success. One of the prisoners told me what they went through at the prep school. I had no idea. And you did that by yourself, right? Here's the payout. What did the prisoner say about the prep school? Judge Zeller was snatching people and brainwashing them like some damn cult. No wonder their numbers exploded. Anything else? Nah. With your help, the roads are a lot safer. Heard you got land of your own. Tell you what, build a safe place for the caravans to stop, and everyone can profit. But either way, you're welcome back to the hill anytime. What she's talking about here are the Bunker Hill trading posts that we now have access to in our settlement build menu. If you build settlements like me, you can now put these trading posts anywhere in your settlement, and there's a chance that when you visit one of your settlements, one of the wandering traders will be there, ready to trade with you. Cricket, Doc Weathers, and any of the other traders that we sometimes find in Bunker Hill. This is a welcome addition to our settlements, and after completing this quest, and if you've also completed the Battle of Bunker Hill, regardless of the faction that you sided with, you can talk with Kessler and gain access to Bunker Hill as a settlement. Listen, Bunker Hill doesn't want any trouble. You have some seriously powerful friends. If it'll keep us on their good side, consider yourself to have the run of the place. And the next time you need something, just ask, all right? Now, if all of the caravan prisoners in the school die, you fail this portion of the quest. If you go back to Kessler, she doesn't say anything. You don't get any additional experience, and you don't get the trading post for your settlements. So just be careful when clearing out the school not to use too many explosives, because you don't want to kill all of the prisoners. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of Judge Zeller, the East Boston Preparatory School, and the side quest, Prep School. Judge Zeller was a monster. His gang grew so quickly because he kidnapped settlers and caravanners and tortured them until they became his raiders. Understanding this makes me sympathetic towards some raiders. The ones in here, at least, had only the option between becoming raiders or more torture and death. I wish there was a way to convert them to somehow save them from their ultimate fate. But regardless of how they became raiders, when they point a gun at you, that leaves you really with only one option. Kill or be killed. There are many more raider gangs and raider bosses to kill, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be going through each and every one of them in upcoming videos. So be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when I publish a new video. Let me know in the comment section below if you have any thoughts on this particular quest, and if there are any other raider gangs that you would like me to do a video about. I read all of your comments, and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. If you'd like to talk about this topic with other like-minded individuals on the Oxhorn Community Discord server, you can find an invitation link in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here with me today watching this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.